We also have service every 2 p.m. in this building. And if you're here, then you know about the service. Amen. <laughs> Masters. <laughs> Amen. We also have a service on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in this building, also on uproot and rejection. And we can't, you know, speak uh, uh, well enough about this series. You know, if you speak to anyone that's been here, uh, testimonies are bound. You know, are rooted in different issues of the heart, issues of life, ministering to situations and circumstances. Um, there was a young brother that came in uh, in the last service. He said he's only going to come in for a while. He heard the service, he heard the preaching, he stayed to the very end, had copies, talked about it, had questions. So it was a blessing. Amen. Amen. So we have a, a concert coming up on the 3rd of June. Yes, yes, yes. Great ministering, great songs, you know, uh, uh, spreading the gospel. Amen. We also have another concert on the 30th of July. And this is going to be a big concert in the park. It's going to be a party in the park for a good party. Amen. Amen. And you're invited, so, so come along and bring someone. Amen. And talking about that, um, we have outreach every Saturday at 11 a.m. And that is a great time just to share your faith. You know, there are people that are lost. There are people that are hurting. You know how it's like uh, uh, living in this world. Things happen, and, and your heart can go through things. You can be in situations, and you can be the answer to someone's prayer, introducing them to Jesus. So come along, spread the gospel, and be a blessing. Amen. Amen. And we also have a guest preacher today, Pastor Carmel. Yes. 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 So that's going to be awesome. Uh, but who knows? Uh, actually, I think I'm going to do this after the offering. Before the offering? Amen. So when a special service comes, special. Yay. Amen. Someone's been listening to service. This is why. So uh, we're going to minister a song for you today. Uh, a few songs for you today, actually. Oh, yeah, for a treat. Concert preview. Amen. So uh, if you... Okay, just one. Okay. Just one. Okay. <laughs> amen. You're going to have to come to the concert. Amen. So, uh, amen. Amen. Oh, yes, it's, it was someone special's birthday recently, and that is why he's going to be ministering along with myself. Amen. So can we give a, a clap for our brother Crash Time? Amen. 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 Yeah. 
bowed every eye closed. You know, we're going to pray. We're going to believe God to, to speak into our hearts. You know, you, you might say to yourself, you know, you know I, I, I only have a little bit. I can only give a little bit. But hey, you know what? As long as you, if, if you give with a, with a heart that's expecting God to move, God is going to do. There's a, a story in the Bible about a lady that gave uh, only two mites compared to the rest of the people that were given uh, loads of money. You know, but she gave with an expectant heart of God moving and God saw the sacrifice. So we're going to believe God to move supernaturally here today. Heads bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to pray. Father, I pray right now, Jesus, uh, for your hand to be upon us. Lord, I'm asking you, oh God, to minister to our hearts. Lord, we're praying, Jesus, that we be liberal, that we be given uh, with an expectant heart for you to be, Lord. Lord, we're trusting in your goodness and your grace. Lord, we're asking you, oh Jesus, uh, help us, help our hearts, God, that we may not uh, be uh, uh, attached to the things of this world, but we will put our hope and our trust our faith in what you, God, is in what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to sing this song.
literally in my God, I need to be more devoted, I need to be better than people, I need to love people more. Like, literally, I get convicted looking at him, at his life. And so he really inspires me. Uh, it's great to see what God's doing here in Enfield. Uh, I'm really inspired uh, what God is doing here. Uh, great friends. It's great to see Roger grow as well. She is on the path of that. Even now, a different person uh, from when I first met him. It's strange to see the camera wrap. <laughs> right? When we got sent out, it was four and a half years ago. So you can imagine. Literally. Right? And I see him acting like a grown man sitting <laughs> down like that. It's like, jeez. <laughs> Levi, I don't want to fight you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, praise God, man. Praise God. You guys are a good church. You've got a good testimony. Uh, people speak about you guys, the sort of impacting and outreaches, etc. It's like the end of the church on fire and Enfield. Like, genuinely, uh, brethren, so in churches with larger numbers, it's like my like, church, like Enfield, and fire, the real deal with it. The DNA, these are words that come out. So, big up yourself, man. You guys got a good testimony. <laughs> Let's turn to the book of John chapter 5. Uh, Pastor Yan lied to you. He said, I'm a heavy preacher. He lied to me. No, but he kept the door open on purpose to keep you guys awake. <laughs> John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Now, there's a number of hospitals uh, and medical centers around the world um, that go after the name of Bethesda. You've got Bethesda Hospital East in Florida. You've got Bethesda Hospital North in Cincinnati. You've got Bethesda Hospital St. Paul in Minnesota. Uh, you've got Bethesda Healthcare in Perth, Western Australia. And you've got another Bethesda in South Africa. You've got all these different medical centers and hospitals that have called themselves Bethesda. In our text, there is a place called Bethesda, which is almost like a hospital. And I will be preaching along this topic today. From John chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 11. Follow with me and God will speak to you. After this, there was a feast for the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity of 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he, was, that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, uh, who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. So I've entitled this sermon, The House of Mercy. We'll talk firstly about the House of Mercy. Our text mentioned, as I mentioned, this word Bethesda. That's what this area is called. This was a place where there was a pool that flows. Um, at certain times, at certain times of the day, there will be a flowing of the water. And, and in this area, there were five shelters where people would chill under it. Uh, when the sun was blazing hot, it's hot, you need some shelter, you'll rest under this and wait all day for this water to begin to flow before entering into this water to be healed. This was a hot spot for many people who were sick. Because it was in this place that they found mercy. In verse 2, now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gates a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. This word Bethesda, or some, some people might call it Bethesda, it literally means the house of mercy, or literally means the house of grace. 
That is the meaning. It was literally named after that word because of what took place in that area at a specific time of day. And so it's literally a house of kindness to those who are undeserving. That's what grace is. It's undeserved favor. It's kindness to people who don't even deserve the kindness. This is the house of mercy. And so what I'm really speaking about right now is the house of God. Because today, you and I are in the house of God. We are in the church. We are in the house of mercy today. Verse 3 says, In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. These sick people would have just been the privileged folks. In other words, listen, when the pool moves at a specific time, only those who are rich and wealthy get first dibs. Only those who are high rank in society, they get first dibs. It's not a place for just the, the high and mighty, but it also wasn't a place where people would look down on that. It's not only the peasants go there. Only the lowlands, only those who can't afford the physicians and doctors, they will go to this house of mercy. In this house of mercy, there would have been a mixture of people. You would have found the wealthy, and you would have found those who weren't wealthy. You would have found those who probably were higher up in life, and those who weren't higher up in life. It would have been a mixture of them both, but in this place, you would have seen people who are desperate for a miracle. They're desperate for mercy. And so what you would have seen is everyone's base nature at work. Maybe I'm, I'm too prim and proper to, to, to rush it It's like as soon as that water flowed, everyone's got in first. I remember when I was young watching this, this um, was a KFC advert uh, somewhere, and I, I think it was like a bucket of KFC in some African village somewhere. And then uh, uh, when, the, when, the, when the, the bucket there, it's like everyone's fighting each other. I've got to get that KFC. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. And that, that's what would have happened when the water flowed. It's like, get out of there. For those who were at school, I don't know if you remember when I was growing up at school, there used to be the thing called scramble. Yeah. Someone would flick a coin, a coin. And everyone's fighting because when that coin, a coin gets three ways and chips, so it goes a long way. <laughs> and that's what would have happened in the house of mercy. Everyone is trying to get into this pool at first. John chapter 5, verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time. To, uh, uh, into the pool and stirred up the water, then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. And that's why they were desperate. And we are the people at the pool of Bethesda. Our text mentions sick people. It's not just describing people who are physically sick, but we're going to apply that spiritually to people who are weak to people who are feeble, to people who are without strength, to people who feel powerless. And yes, there may be people here today who are sick physically, but maybe you're here and you are weak uh, emotionally, and you are weak spiritually. You literally feel powerless from time to time. You feel like you can't go. And I know right now we're good. We don't have a powerful worship service. But come Tuesday or come Friday, you're back in the same place. I can't go on. I feel so powerless. We are the people who are sick by the pool. But the thing, I can't continue this Christian walk no more. That happens one more time. Maybe some of you have called cool. Pastor Yeah, and I quit. I can't do it no more. Keep coming, I don't quit. And then you've been able to go on again. She's like, I'm weak. I'm sick. I just can't overcome this sin no more. I've tried. I've prayed, Lord, forgive me loads of times. I just can't do it no more. Tired. I just can't parent my kids anymore. I'm trying to be patient, but it's like they're driving me. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling weak. I'm feeling powerless. And in these moments, people tend to run away. But we need to run to the house of mercy, which is what we've done. And so we're in the right place. Our text also mentions another group of people. It mentions the blind. So you've got the physically blind. People who Literally can't see everyone can see because you've got your eyes on me. But you also got those who are mentally blind. It's describing something that is opaque as if it's, you know, something that is smoky. And so it's like things are not clear. And maybe for some of us, things aren't making so much sense right now. 
You know, you start interpreting God, it makes sense. You give your life to Christ, he improves your life. He you gives your life to Christ, he sets you free of your sin. He you gives your life to Christ, he's got a plan for you, and on you go. You live in dominion and freedom and blessing, and, and it makes sense. Joy and peace and righteousness. But how do you know, as you go along life, things don't seem to make sense. It's like, wait a minute. I gave, why am I experiencing financial reversal? Wait a minute, I forgave. Why is, why is that why is the person I forgave now giving me a smack in my face? And it's like things don't make sense. I'm going through these trials and tribulations. It's like I've prayed and fasted. I've, I've lived for God. I've given myself to the things of God. But it's like things are just not making sense right now. I thought what, what the Bible said. I thought the preacher said. I thought God was like, and it's like, oh, you're so hazy now. It's so smoky. I don't understand why this is happening. Maybe your faith is shaky right now. Maybe you're struggling to see God. Yeah, you believe, it's why you're here. I'm holding on to his word. But if I'm real, I don't know if I can see him all too well. I mean, I saw him. That's why I got saved. But I just don't know. It's a blindness. So hazy. Think about Job. Job, faithful man. Waking up every day. Praying and worshiping, giving sacrifice for his children. A man devoted to God. Then this trial comes upon his life. And he's seeing, he's holding his hand. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Yeah, but God is still God. Curse God and die. No. I don't know what you're talking about. But as you read on in the book of Job, you start to see the man start, God, where are you, man? He starts with this man of faith. Because the question is like, where are you, God? Because I wish I was never, I was never even born. It's like I can't, I can't even see him anymore. See, it's in these moments, we need to go to the house of mercy. Because it's in the house of mercy you get a clear vision. It's in the house of mercy when you get clear perspective. I think about the psalm of Asaph in Psalm 73. He's troubled. We know the story. He is my name. I'm living for God. He's giving his life for the things of God. And then he's looking around. He's like, why are the wicked prospering? The wicked are doing well, but here I am, the righteous, and I'm struggling. That makes no sense. And so he's struggling through his thoughts. Uh, why are they joyful? Why are they happy? Why did they get away with all the wrongdoing? And here's me sacrificing day in and day out to do what's right, and I'm not experiencing what I'm expecting to experience. God, it makes no sense. It was the day we pre social media, looking on the Facebook or the Instagram. Looking at his lovely lives, people like these people curse God. They're enjoying it. It makes no sense. God, I just can't. Does this really work? Is it actually work? I'm wasting my time. I've wasted my effort serving God. I've wasted my money giving. I've wasted my annual leave on conference. And so I'm thinking all these thoughts and we reach the stage sometimes it's like, let's stuff it, man. I'm just going to do me. Come, church. When you come to the house of God, get a clear perspective. Psalm 73, verse 17. Until I went to the, uh, uh, into the sanctuary or the house of God, then I understood therein. Then I was able to see clearly. Therein. I was confused and made no sense. Why are the wicked prospering? But when I went into the sanctuary of God, when I went to the house of God, I got clear perspective that life is
Jesus has helped us and changed us and restored our lives. We've testified of it. But if we're honest with ourselves, there's no parts from the past that we still creeping us today. But those who are faithful to the Wednesday series are with rejection. He would know. So ironically, that wasn't working. I'm doing it in my church too. For a quick plug, if you guys don't go Wednesdays, I advise you go and change your life. It's literally changed my life. Those people crippled by the past. And it's like we're moving on, but it's almost like we can trip up a bit. Someone said something that reminded us of the past. We went somewhere that reminded us of something that we had done in this area. Or we hear a certain song and it makes us feel all down and depressed because it reminds us of the state that we were at in life. And so it's like we're crippled by the past. And so we can see the future. We can see ahead. Yes, I know what God's got for me. I want to walk right through the door, but. I know, man. Because the past crippled. Some of us are crippled back here. Go through life, but then we experience something that causes us to be fearful. It could be financial, it could be your life, it could be mental, it could be seeing somebody. It could be bad, I want to date and get married, but I don't know if I can trust someone again and get my heart broken again. And, and we have this fear in our hearts. What if I give my life? What if I give all to God? What if I open up and there's this fear that binds us and it, it cripples us? And so it's like we still move on with God, but we're crippled by this fear. So it's only so effective we can live for Him, we're only so far we can go. Because we're crippled. Some of us are crippled by unbelief. I don't know if God will do that for me. Maybe for them. Don't know about that. Crippled by offenses and bitterness. Spoke to me like that. How dare they? I mean, every time you hear a sermon on forgiveness, boom! Not them. Don't deserve it. Do you know what they've done to me? But they're crippled. Because God wants to bless us and let us free and live for Him, but it's like, no! It's like we hear about a sermon, we're going to help people, we're going to bless you. We hear about sin, we repent, we hear about healing, and righteousness, and going for God, evangelism. We're like, yeah, we're going. Then we hear another sermon of forgiveness, and it's crippling. It's, it's, it. it's deep. There's so many layers to our life. We're crippled by sin. We go on, chip up to that sin again. We go on, chip up to that sin again. If that's you in this place, you're in the right place, you're in the house of mercy. That's where the lane went, the house of mercy. He also mentioned those who are paralyzed. Talking about members who are deprived of natural juices or the blood isn't flowing to the area of their limbs. And so their limbs are just wasting away and they're shrinking. If you see people who are paralyzed, maybe in a wheelchair, you find that their legs are always smaller, right, than the rest of their body. And because the blood's not flowing, it's shrinking away. It's unable to be used. Or in other words, it's gone dry. And maybe right now your faith has gone dry. You believe God. But after a while of being disappointed and hit after hit, trial after trial, your faith has gone dry. And so you will come out of religious practice. I'm going to make heaven my home. But you won't believe God for anything. You won't believe God for financial breakthrough. You won't believe God for your health. You won't believe God for the salvation of your loved one. You won't believe God for your own mental state. You won't believe God for your own life and your own future. Your faith has gone dry. And so you hear these nice messages. And it's like, I wish I could believe that, but my faith has gone dry. Maybe your marriage has gone dry. At home, no, no love, no kind words, it's just dry, it's just there for the kids, and it's just dry. Life is just dry. I can't move on, I'm dry, I'm paralyzed. I'm no longer crippled. I'm now stuck in this state where you're in the house of mercy. Yeah. And so that narrative can be changed in the right place. In our text, the sick, the lame, the paralyzed, the blind, they found healing at the house of mercy. John chapter 5 verse 4, whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. We're in the house of mercy today. Praise God. Are we happy in the house of mercy? Amen. Amen. We'll have a moment to pray. Now we're going to talk secondly then at the fact that 
We can be in the house of mercy and yet show no mercy. We've heard it said that the church is a hospital, right? We've heard that saying, the common saying, come as you are, don't worry about your life, the church is a hospital and you'll be fixed up and you'll be healed. You know, a hospital is the best place for sick people because they can find treatment for whatever they're sick with. People have died and not go in hospital. You know, I read all these accounts of COVID and, and, and people who caught COVID for just a little minor cold and, and so they just stayed at home and treated it anyway. Maybe just took a little bit of lemsip, a little bit of lockets, perhaps even thought I'd be fine, and then they died of COVID. And so people who didn't go to hospital died as a result of it. So the hospital's the best place for, for, for sick people. Likewise, the house of God, the hospital for the souls of man, is the best place for people who are wounded by things of life, you are troubled in life, you have sinned, you are sick, you are in need of mercy. The hospital, uh, the, the church, is the best place, but not everybody feels this way. Because the sad thing is, people can be in the house of mercy and yet show no mercy. In verse 6 and verse 7, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. So here you have in the house of mercy a lack of mercy. Because every time he paces to the pool as fast as he can go, uh, he's crawling there as fast as he can go, another person steps in with no regard of him. There's no listen, you've been here before me, I'll just kind of wait for you. It's as he's gone, it's on the passes and he gets in, year in and year out, uh, no regard of this man. They rush into the pool, they get themselves sorted out, and out they go. So what we see here is people who actually have forgotten that they receive mercy. Because the blind would not have seen the water stir. They're blind. How would they know? They needed somebody else to take them there. Those who can't walk couldn't get themselves fast enough. They would have needed help. But the paralyzed had no chance of getting there. They would have needed to be lifted by somebody else. The sick would have hoped that they felt good enough at that time that the pool was stirred so that they can get there. And so they needed mercy themselves. But they had no intention of showing mercy to others. So they dip in the pool, they get killed, and they walk right by this paralyzed man, and off they go. They all. In the house of mercy, you know, but show me no mercy. Are we like this sometimes? Maybe we're just like sold out for Christ, sold out for soul. Listen, I saw it on that man. There are some times it's like all about God blesses me and the next person is just, I don't even think about them like that. Jesus has helped us, he's restored us, he's healed us, he's worked a miracle in our lives. And, and we see other people in similar states sometimes, but we just leave them there. How many people do you see broken and battered, being messed around by some other man, and you've been healed, and your heart's been healed after being broken from another man, and you don't think to share your faith with them? I'm in a rush, I've got work. What if they reject me? What if they embarrass me? You with me right now? You see some people begging for money like outside the book, he's broken, you know you're going to give them money and they're going to go back in the book and you know they're bound in this addiction, they're bound in this cycle, but you are bound in addiction yourself and you cycle yourself and you tried to get free from but you couldn't, so you gave yourself until someone told you about Christ and gave you a hope that your life could change, but you walk past these very same people. This is real folks. I'll just pray for them. It's us, man. No one's prayer would have helped that paralyzed man. He needed physical help to get in that pool. You can pray for him all you like, still lying for 38 years. You know, this sermon is real because it, it, it convicts me. I remember me and my wife were on our way to a revival service to do it. So we're on our way to church. This was uh, probably 
at some point last year, I think last year in March, we're on our way to church and we're running late, so I'm just all kind of stressed, but I want to get all time and work and everything. So we, we stop at a traffic light and you've got this, you know when you stop at a traffic light, you have these uh, uh, like these, these beggars who kind of come and they yeah. beg. It's like, you know, you've got those kind of people. I don't think of anyone because I just, I just don't. Anyways, I just speak that with me afterwards and ask why, but I don't give them money. I'd rather share the gospel of the Bible to accept. I'm not going to give you money for fun or kind of religion or whatnot. But, anyways, so normally these people are older, they're like middle age plus, normally. But we saw someone who was young, mm. in their 20s. And Anna said, Man, that's so sad. Like this young person is on the side of the car, begging. Like you don't see this kind of stuff outside of London like that anyway. And she's like, that's so sad. And, and as she's saying this, she had so, so much compassion. And I just said, yeah, well, they would have heard the gospel and chose their, chose their own way and rejected it. So and I said, no, you're heartless. <laughs> what do you mean I'm heartless? What are you talking about I'm heartless? He's like, no, they would have been shared the gospel, they would have chosen to say no, so they put themselves in this condition, it's up to them. It's like, no, that's heartless, Carmel. That's not right. And here we are on the way to the Bible, we're arguing. And they're like, no, you're wrong. She's saying, no, you're wrong. We get to church, hey, anyway. you know it's smile, right? Hey, you know, the pastor, I, I had to close you prayer that day as well, imagine. And, 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 and so, this, so this is the apostle. Yeah, yeah, they deserve what they get. Yeah, I don't say, man, if only we could help us somehow. I know they had their chance, and I'm writing this sermon, and I go, bam! Convicted of going out of them. You receive mercy. You walk right past someone else who needed mercy. That man could have been you. But I saved you at 19. So you never spent your 20s uh, begging outside someone's car because you needed mercy. You got mercy, and now I want you to extend your mercy, and you're not willing to. Dealt with you. Hmm. Ain't no man of God passed us up here. We're all humans. That's right. We can receive mercy, but lack to extend that mercy. You can be in the house of God, but be in the house of mercy, but not grasp God's mercy. It's a difference. Be in the house of mercy and grasp with his mercy. Verse 8 to verse 10, Jesus said to him, Rise up. Take up your bed and walk. Immediately the man was made well, he took up his bed and walked, and that day um, was the Sabbath. The Jews said um, to him, He was cured. It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. I mean, of all things you pick up here, you've been seeing this man for 38 years, lying there, stinking, just drying out there for 38 years. The first time you see him in some of your whole entire lives, he's walking, carrying a bed for the first time. It's not thinking, wow, look what the Lord has done. The first thing you point out is you're carrying a bed on the Sabbath. You ought not to carry nothing on the Sabbath. Are you being serious? Instead of marveling at this great miracle, a bunch of rules, they missed the point. But aren't we like it sometimes? We can see a person in church touched by Jesus supernaturally, but yeah, they're still smoking. The guy just come to church and you're putting out the guy's having the smoke out there. Are you serious? Yeah, 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 you know, powerful the sisters got saved, yeah, but they've got an attitude from the soul rude. I don't want to talk to that. Are you being serious? They come church and have a bad and they cuss. What do you say? Are you being still? Have you not seen that Jesus set them free of drugs and set them and alcohol and healed them and in their mind they were not kids without their the right and you're putting out these things? Are you being serious? That's how we are. We can get so religious that we miss the miracle that Jesus had done in the person being in church in the first place that they are saved. Well, side of this could be in the homes. Harsh parents, harsh spouses, harsh managers at work. Mm. The spouse does something good, yeah, but you didn't do that. Why feel the whole up? You feel the whole up here. Who with this one little mat over here? <laughs> You're putting out all these different little folks. You know, oh, the child comes back, man, I've got a B. I don't know what the greatest stuff is, like number two. I've got a three. And he's like, yeah, we did get one. You missed the point. 
you try and work so hard yeah. to get the best and you're putting up. Yeah, so. so man, I know exactly what that feels like. Mm. Yeah, child came out the room and you didn't do your homework. Are you serious? You're missing the whole point, man. Anyway, I sign you got a little man for me anyway. You know, I remember hearing the story of Pastor Brown and the best. Pastor Brown's so nice, you can't imagine the best. He's so nice. But I remember hearing a story about him being vet. So there was a, 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 a new convert come church, a baby come church. Powerful salvation. I was told this, I need to you know, actually ask him more about it. But uh, I was told this by one of the pastors who was staff at the time. And this woman uh, come to church, a broken woman. You can tell she was like a loose woman. Uh, just, you know, you broke her looking for affection in men, along with many people's testimonies. And so she come to church and she comes just kind of dressing loose, tight clothes, uh, 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 um, you know, just mad loose, like almost like, what's it, grand night club or something, like loose. Anyways, she comes to church and, you know, she tries to change a little bit, but it's still loose, right? Mm -hmm. Still wearing short skirt, right up to her thigh, still wearing very, very tight. The tights are like, kind of like, them kind of tights, I have to describe them. <laughs> so she, she's dressed in this way, cleaving, belly top, back, that's like the whole lot, right? She's dressed in the whole lot, and so she's come in church for a bit. And some of them, you know, hey, you, so you should dress properly in church, right? Like, we're Christians now. We should dress that kind of way. She's come in church, and some of the women in church could not like, really, like, probably. It's like, it's not fair on the men, right? Imagine like trying to walk her to the front row and she walks in front of her dress like it's like, it's not fair on the men, we're in church. And so, speak to her, you know, hey, you know she dress better. Yeah, that's not really church clothes, you know. They, they, they speak to her and they correct her. And after a while of doing this, she speaks to the pastor and she's in tears. Wow. So I'm leaving church. I'm vexed. I'm leaving church. People keep commenting on the way I'm dressed. Mm. But this is literally what I have. Oh. This is the most modest that I have. Mm. And so you have all these faithful sisters in church who missed the point that this woman had given her life to Christ, had been transformed, that she wants to be in church, she didn't even have done it, but to stay at home. Let me just hide out, I shouldn't be there, I'm, just, I'm a righteous we know how that feels like, yeah. but I'm going to come anyway in a place where everyone's going to accept me for who I am, a place where I'm going to have an opportunity to meet with God and change me and transform me, but all people keep picking out is my faults. So listen, we need to be careful not to be fault finders. Yeah. We need to be careful when we see people who come in with broken backgrounds, and we just go accept them and move. Yes, they might smell a little bit. Yes, they might curse a little bit. Yes, they might have an attitude problem, but the bigger picture is you've received mercy yeah. because they deserve an opportunity yeah. to receive mercy because they might be like how you are now. Mm. So if you could grant, grant God's mercy, you would be better people, better spouses, better parents, better Christians. We could be so much more people out there. Mm. Let's have a little part of this. Remember, you receive mercy. Yeah. Amen. Let me talk now about my last point. And that is that God is merciful no matter how long the circumstance has been. Mm. You know, when we've been in a situation for so long, it's very, very discouraging. In verse 5 of our text now, it says, A certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. The man was sick 38 years. Listen, I've been sick sometimes for a lot of time. You know, I, I fractured my hand in the end of March. And just this Thursday, they put in a sling and had a big cast around it. It was so frustrating, it felt like forever. I can't imagine having this cast, just in one hand, so functioning for 38 years. That's actually, I don't know how, how long that should be, blow my brain off. <laughs> but here's this man, he's paralyzed 38 years. Imagine how he would have been paralyzed. He's a squalid, he's extremely dirty, unpleasant man. We walk past these homeless people sometimes, it's like, mm, I can't breathe in, back off for cold face mask sometimes. It's like, don't smell good. You talk to them and it's like, I, can, I feel like I'm gagging right now. Imagine how this man at the house of mercy would have been for 38 years. 
that strong stench, just repulsive. Many people try to go out. I don't know about that, right? You imagine how his teeth would have been. He can't brush it, he can't move. He's all crooked, black, yellow, orange, falling out of the whole lot. You know, his nails would have been nasty. As soon as you reach out his hand to grab you, it's like, I don't know, hairy, the list goes on and on. His hair all kind of patchy and just nasty. If insects call him on him, he's bound like you don't care no more skin and bones. For 38 years, he just dared look absolutely fried. How much hope do you think he had after 38 years? I mean, maybe at first, when he first got there, yeah, yeah, week, month, maybe after the year even, mm-hmm. but 38 years, he would have had no more hope there. True. It's been happening for too long. If God would have helped me, he would have helped me already. Mm-hmm. But 38 years, this man is here. 450 months. 38 years of barrenness. 38 years of, of not moving forward. 38 years of, of feeling like life is on a treadmill. 38 years of unanswered prayers. You tell me how much hope you feel like you've had after this long. Like me, some of us are even 38 years old. A long time. 38 years of sin can my life ever change? In church, out of church, in church, out of church. I'm on fire for God. Now I'm barely saved. Like, yeah, I'm on impact team. No, I'm avoiding impact team. Like, for so long, my life is always. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Because no matter how long the circumstance has been, no matter how long the struggle with finances, the struggle with your mind, the struggle in seeing your family member get saved, the struggle for healing in your marriage and your home, the struggle for believing God for your child, the struggle for believing for a spouse, the struggle for work, and this goes on and on and on. No matter how long you've been waiting and believing God for, there is always hope. God's merciful. Is there anything to leave here that God is merciful? Mm. That means there is always hope. Yeah. It's always worth holding on. Yeah. I don't care how long, how long I've been praying. There is always a point to hold on because we know that this man found his miracle after 38 years. And if God is merciful, there is always hope for me that at a specific time, God is going to move for me as long as I'm still in the right place. Yeah, come on. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Let me ask you. Do you want to be made well of your fill in the blank? Do you want to be made? He asked him. The man doesn't even ask Jesus. He won't even recognize him as Jesus. And even if he did, maybe someone said, is that Jesus? I don't know. I'm just speculating. The man never asked. But Jesus asked him. Because listen, now God, who is merciful, who sees you in your state, is here today to be like, do you want something you can receive for? Amen. Praise God for that. That's the God that we serve. See, mercy is the, is the desire to remove one from misery. That God is a merciful God. That's what he said, I am a merciful God. That means in him lies a desire to remove one from misery. Yeah. I want to end the misery that you're experiencing. This is the heart of God. Amen. Amen. See, our text says that Jesus saw this man. See, when he looked at him, when Jesus looked at this man, he saw a helpless man. He saw a hopeless man. He saw a rejected man. He saw a sinful man. He saw a depressed man. He saw all these things on the exterior, but also a text said that he saw he saw past the exterior. He saw beyond the state. He's not just a skinny man. He's not just a smelly man. He's not just a dirty, wretched man. I can see the issue inside because I see beyond the exterior. 
to. I might not be able to see you, but you saw the God who sees you. Was it not Hagar who was on a run? And she, she, she named that area after God who sees me. Oh, my, I have met the God who sees me because God sees you even when nobody does. Man looks on the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, God is so concerned about you and so concerned about your life. He wants to transform you. Now, he's not just going to label you based on what you've done or based on the outside. But let me come right in. Open up. I'm knocking on the door. Let me come right in so that you can experience my mercy. That's the God that we serve. So we can pray. Hallelujah. When Jesus sees us and he sees what's on the inside, he's driven to compassion. This word saw is to look at, to observe, to speak, to take special notice or to attention. This is the heart of God. He right before Jesus fed the 5,000 in Matthew chapter 14, in verse 14, it says he saw. Remember what that means? A special notice. A ten, never just saw a bunch of them. So, no, no, he saw them and he looked at them and I can see that there is a need here. His compassion began to well up within him. He said that he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. And right after that point, you see him that he's able to feed the 5,000 because that's the God that we serve. It's the heart of God. See, Jesus wants us to know that he is the answer to every issue. Don't look outside. Don't be discouraged, Mr. I quit. I can't do it. Now there's no way. I tried that. Listen, left all that talk out the door out there. Amen. If you've got that talk in here, you're going to have time at the altar to come and pray. Yeah. Jesus is the answer to every issue. We never just sang that song. I believe you are all. We never just sang that, but it's a nice rhythm. Jesus really is all we need. He is the answer to every issue. Verse 8 to verse 9, Jesus said to him, Rise up. Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. You see, it would have been a noble thing for Jesus to help this man. He'd be like, hold on to my arm. Let me, let me take you into this pool. But if the pool's not the answer, yeah. I am the answer. You've been waiting 38 years looking for the pool, but you, you're waiting for me. I'm the one who's going to help you and heal you. Don't worry about this pool. Don't worry about waiting for the right person who can have compassion on you. You're looking for me, old man of 38 years. And Jesus will say to you, listen, don't wait on the money. Don't wait on the right person. Don't wait on the perfect circumstance. As long as you have me. Because I am what you need. It is me. Jesus told him, you take off the bed you go. I want you to go. Mm. Man, Jesus is so good. Yeah. Money's not the answer, man. Come on. Relationship's not the answer. Like, work is not the answer. Mm. Some of these things are the answer, man. Mm. Your material, but you have a nice house, but you have a nice car. But none of these are the answer. Mm. Jesus is the answer. I've spent so many years of my life but searching for somebody to fulfill my void and, yeah. and give me a purpose in life. I look in this relationship and that girl, I go party and splash your bottles and get weighed. And I, I do all these different things. If I could just have money, yeah. I buy this item of clothing. If I could just, and all the time, it's like, if I could just, I'm listening to the celebrities and their music and their, their life. If I could just not even know that they're miserable, you probably yeah. more miserable than I am. That's why you see talking about suicide and drug abuse. That's a different story, yeah. but it's that if, I, if only I could just, then I'm there, Jesus. That's right. Come on. I don't need this stuff anymore, man. Yeah. I don't need this. That's right. The woman at the well. How many men? Uh -huh. But I met the one. Come on. Yeah. Boy, I find the man who told me. Because Jesus is the answer. That's right. He is the answer. Yeah. Uh, if we bring all our problems, and all our issues to Jesus, he is merciful. Remember, the desire to move, to remove one's misery. He is merciful to move in our lives. Bring all your worries. Bring all your sins. 
Bring all your weights. Yeah. Bring whatever baggage that you have in your life. Bring it to Christ. And Christ is merciful because we are in the house of mercy. We are in the house of God. And if you bring it this afternoon, I can guarantee you meet with Jesus. And you are the same way. Can you say amen? Amen. Praise amen. Let's bow our hands this afternoon.